right, good morning. Good morning. All right, got a title of today's message, uh, Patience and Overcoming. I know we talked a little bit about trials last week, but we're going to kind of continue with that uh, vein today. James 1.1 1, 1 says this, James, a bondservant of God and our Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here today, to gather together in your word. Father, we ask that you open up our hearts and our minds. Give us wisdom that we might see the depth of your word today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many know that every Christian needs a little more patience, right? Patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. It says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. That word long-suffering could be translated patience. And as I said last week, that life will test you. It will test you in many ways. And one of the ways that it tests us is through temptation. And when we are tempted, God will give us the strength to overcome. He also gives us wisdom to deal with those temptations. It is His desire that we all overcome every single temptation. I want you to know that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we absolutely can. Amen? Having patience in the midst of a trial and temptations is actually the, the fruit that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. So let's take a look at the book of James. James starts off by talking about that he is a bondservant of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now James was the brother of Jesus. Uh, Mary and Joseph were married. They had at least six children. And James, like I said, he refers to him. He doesn't refer to him as James, the brother of Jesus, but he refers to himself as a bondservant of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't like he was name dropping. Yeah, you know, Jesus, he my bro. You know, he, he wasn't like that. He, he knew his rightful place in the hierarchy of the kingdom of God. And how many know that we would all be better off if we had that mentality? Humility is an important component in the life of a believer. Now he goes on in the second verse, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, you stop right there for a moment because that's kind of hard to grasp. Why on earth would anyone... Why on earth would anyone count it all joy when you come and when trials come your way? And he tells us that we should count it all joy. He tells us this. Now, last week we looked at 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13. He says, Let him who thinks he stand take heed, lest he fall. He says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And we talked about not being presumptuous or self-confident that our trust should never be in ourselves. Our trust belongs in God. Now sometimes you may think you're alone in the midst of trials when you're going through them that nobody knows what you're going through. Paul assures us here that there is nothing that you're going through that others haven't faced. So you are not alone. Others have faced it and they overcame. So trust in the Lord because He will bring you through it. You know, uh, and, and I will say this, and we have to listen closely to this. You have to trust the Lord and not your feelings. And this is important because your feelings will deceive you. We live in a time where we give too much weight to feelings. Somehow feelings become more important than actions. Feelings have become more important than truth or reality. You know, and, 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 and 
it's important because, you know, we, we talk about, oh, well, you know, to be a moral person and to be kind, uh, you know, just if, if that's their pronouns, you, you, you have to, 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 to agree with them. We're living in a day where truth doesn't matter. You know, think about this. I, I thought about this. My dad, when he was dying, before he died, uh, he had complications to, uh, because of diabetes. He had his second leg amputated. We're sitting in the hospital, and they had given him morphine. And there he was. He looks over at us, and he says, Get my shoes. Now, would I be a moral, upstanding person if I just played along with him? No, I, I wasn't being mean, but I'm like, Dad, you don't need your shoes right now. You know, and, and the fact is, is that what we're doing, you, you have, or is it, is it moral or kind to, to someone who has schizophrenia, for example? Right? They have schizophrenia, and they really believe that their neighbors are going to come over to their house and kill them. Should we play along to be kind? Or do we address the issue at hand? And this is the problem. The fact is, is that your feelings will deceive you. And sometimes you might have a feeling about something, but that is, your feeling is not gospel. People all the time, they're like, well, I don't feel like God loves me. I don't care what you feel. What does the Bible say? For God so loveth the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Your feelings will deceive you. It isn't about what Brian was talking about earlier. It isn't about you know, your, your feelings. It's what does the Word say, and that's why it's so important. Because, I mean, you, you can be deceived by your feelings, and Satan will manipulate your life to your feelings. And this is important that we, we, we understand and know the Word of God. And to follow up on something else he said, I would not trust any man with my salvation. Amen. And you don't need to trust any man, including me, with your salvation. You need to go to the source yourself. Truth is important. Facts are important. God's Word is truth. God's Word is truth. You cannot hold feelings higher than God's words. Amen? And so this is important that, that we understand that God's love for you is perfect. His love does not change with your circumstances. So don't trust your feelings. Trust God. Trust His Word. We look to the, the, the Lord who will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. For by the grace of God, we are overcomers. We will not be defeated. Verse 2 begins with, My brethren. And, uh, and this is for believers, right? He's talking to believers. He says, My brethren. Back up. My brethren. Count it all joy when you fall. When you fall. Now, we'll get to the joy part in a minute, but notice how this is phrased. Most people don't intentionally fall, right? And it's written in a way to suggest that these trials can happen unexpectedly, right? It's kind of like having a green light. You let off the brake. You start to go through the intersection and then all of a sudden, bam! You get broadsided. And that's how tri trials come into our life. They, they, everything is going well, life is good, and then all of a sudden, unwelcome trials enter your life. And James says that he says this, fall into various trials. The trials that we go through, they're various, right? They're various. They're usually not the same trial over and over and over again. If they are, I would say take a look in the mirror because might, you might be the problem there. You know, I, I know someone who, who loves to gossip about everybody, right? This person loves to gossip. And they'll put down one part of the family to the other part of the family. And then one day when it got revealed, right, when it got revealed that she was causing division in the family, this woman, like I said, she has her own problems with her family and her employers and her teacher, her kids' teachers, and she sits around thinking, 
that it is that she's being singled out, that the whole world is against her. She has the victim mentality. But the fact is, is that she acts as a victim in a problem that she created. That is completely different. That isn't what I'm talking about. That isn't falling into various trials. Those trials I'm talking about, those were self-inflicted. And the fact is, is that during trials, this is a good time for self-reflection. God, how can I change? How can I handle things differently? We need to grow, and you cannot grow without self-reflection. You have to be willing to take a look at yourself that you might be able to change and become more Christ-like. See, none of us are perfect. We all have room to grow. But if you're always right, you'll never mature in the Lord. James tells us in verse 3 why we should count it all joy. Because he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Trials will test your faith. Do you really have faith? Everybody will serve a God that, that gives them health, wealth, and success in their life. Everybody will serve a God like that. But there are many people who follow Christ who, you know, uh, they'll follow a Christ who makes the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the sick to heal, to, to, that are being healed, demons being cast out. But like I say, when the trials come, many people scattered from Him. There are those who have true faith. And, and, and the, those that have true faith, it is, it is proved through the trials that they are going through. The word in the Greek is hyponomi, and it could be translated steadfastness, endurance, perseverance. Knowing that the test of your faith produces endurance. And this is important. You know, I was thinking about trials and endurance, and I, I, I thought about a story that I had read some time ago, and it was about a little boy named Glenn. This little boy, he went to this old country schoolhouse, uh, and this old country schoolhouse was heated by this old-fashioned pot belly, you know, coal stove. And, and it was Glenn's uh, job to get there early, and he would get the fire started, right? Him and his brother... So it would be warm by the time everybody got there. Well, the teacher, by the time the teacher had showed up with the, uh, some other kids, the whole building was up in flames. They ran in because what had happened is that Glenn mistaken gasoline for kerosene. And so the, the whole place went up in, in flames and they were able to pull Glenn out, but his brother Floyd uh, did not make it. They took uh, Glenn to the uh, hospital. He had severe burns from the waist down. And uh, it was so bad uh, that the doctor told his mother that he probably wouldn't live and even said it might be for the best because he's burnt pretty bad. Well, the little boy didn't want to die. Uh, Glenn, he, didn't, he made up his mind that he was going to survive. And, uh, but the fact is, is that he would be doomed to be crippled the rest of his life. And the boy managed to gather strength. Um, like I said, he, he got out of the hospital, but he could not move his legs. He had no feeling in them. Uh, and his mother would, would one day wheel him out into the yard. And when she wheeled him out into the yard, he threw him, instead of just sitting there, he threw himself on the ground and he crawled to the fence. And he propped, got himself up and he went along that fence from one post to the next. And he did that day after day after day. His mom would massage his legs. And do you know that the next year he walked to school? And a little bit after that, you know what else happened? He started running to school. When he got into, uh, when he got into college, he started running track. He had gotten so fast that uh, in 1938, he ran the world's fastest mile in four minutes and four seconds. And at that time, he owned 12 of the 31 fastest mile times on record. And it was through endurance that Dr. Glenn Cunningham 
had overcome what other people thought was a permanent disability. You know, that is the message of trial and endurance. There's, there, there, there's also one other reason that we need to count it all joy is because it works in us patience. It works in us endurance. It ultimately makes us stronger. Verse 4, he says, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. It's like a man who prayed, said, God, I ask you for patience, and I want it right now. <laughs> right? The fact is, is that the word perfect in the Greek, teleos, could be translated perfect or mature. And the lesson here is that let patience have its perfect work. There comes a time when you think that, you know, that we might be strong enough, right? We're mature enough. We don't need to change. Thinking that you can stand in the midst of any storm that comes your way. One may feel that way, but you don't know until you've been tested. You don't know how hard life can be. I was talking to Tim yesterday, and he's had a lot of difficulties. 29 brain surgeries, Tim. And no one knows what Tim has gone through. I can hear about those stories, but I don't know what Tim has gone through. Right? And, and I'm sure at times he feels like giving up, but somehow he finds the strength to press on. He finds that strength. You just don't know what others go through. I was talking to a man who, who told me he would, that he was a Christian, and he was saying, oh, I'd die for Jesus. You know, and this guy, not that I was judging, but he was very carnal. He had an awful lot of baggage, right? And I asked him again, I said, are you really willing to die for Jesus? And he says, absolutely. I said, then why don't you live for him? Dying's easy. We can all, we're all going to die. Amen. I've said it before. We're all going to die whether we want to or not. Dying's easy. It's living for Christ that's difficult, especially in this time. The Christian life is not about living for yourself, but it is a daily dying to self. And the trials that come into our life, they test your faith. They work in you patience and endurance. And we may get to the point where we say, enough, I've had, I have enough patience. Trust the Lord. He knows your needs. He knows tomorrow. He knows what it will take today to equip you for tomorrow. The trials today will make you stronger tomorrow. Look what he says next in the fifth verse. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives with all liberty. Excuse me gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James, he talks about these various trials. He talks about the testing of your faith, producing patience, producing endurance, and allowing the patience and endurance to have its perfect work, that you may be perfect or mature, lacking nothing. And then he starts talking about wisdom. What does wisdom have to do with your faith being tested in various trials. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, and it's hard to understand, it's hard to find meaning in the midst of trials. It's hard to find purpose in the midst of trials. Going through the darkest day of my life, I sat there and I thought, my God, this just seems like needless suffering. What is this all about? Why? You, you know, if you find yourself in that place, lacking wisdom, the Bible says, let him ask of God. Let him ask of God. He didn't say ask man. He said, let him ask of God who gives to, look here, all. He didn't say some. He said all. And that does not ex exclude anyone. But there is a stipulation. It says in verse 6, but you need to know that ask of God who gives all liberally. And that means, that word hapalos in the Greek, which means uh, simply 
sincerely, without reproach, it will be given to him. See, God will give you wisdom. Viktor Frankl, he wrote in Man's Search for Meaning, he says this, Those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. And that's pretty deep. That if you know why you're going through something, it's a whole lot easier to go through it. Wisdom will help you endure the most difficult trials. He says, ask of God, but look what he says in the sixth verse. But let him ask in faith. Let him ask in faith. Asking in faith uh, that you know when you ask in faith that God is going to give you the wisdom that you ask for. It means no doubting. Even if it doesn't come when you want it, you know that he will give you the wisdom that you're asking for. And look what else he says. For he who doubts is like a wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind. He compares a doubter to the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. A doubter will constantly be moved by the circumstances in their life. They will. Those who, who walk in faith, they, they stand firm no matter what the circumstances are around them. They don't waver in their faith. They trust the Lord no matter what's happening around. But those who are doubters, boy, they're just all over the place. They're here one day, they're there the next day. Have you seen people that go from one extreme to the other? One day they're way up here, the next day they're down there. And then we start diagnosing them to, you know, bipolar or whatever. But the fact is, is that's what doubters are. I trust the Lord no matter what the circumstances are around me. Amen. There's no stability. There is no peace for the doubters. Just as when uh, Peter had taken his eyes off Jesus, Peter was doing fine when Jesus called him out on the water. Peter was doing fine, but as soon as Peter took his eyes off Christ and started looking at the wind and the waves, that's when he began to sink. He began to cry out, right? And, and, and Jesus, he asked him, he says, why did you doubt? See, we have got to keep our eyes on Christ. Ask for wisdom in faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What does it mean he believed that he is? That he is everything his word says he is. That he is God. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. That he is and that he is a rewarder. Because you know what? If you know that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, guess what you're going to do? You're going to diligently seek him. But you must ask in faith. He goes on in the seventh verse of James, For let not this man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. See, you have to make a choice. There's no peace in between two decisions. It's like standing behind somebody at Dunkin' Donuts while they pick a dozen donuts out. You know, I mean... You stand in there and they cannot decide and you're thinking, my goodness, there's no right or wrong here. Just pick one. <laughs> right? I mean, what are they going to get home? They get home, eat the donut, and go, oh man, I should have chose that chocolate one with the, with the sprinkles. <laughs> the fact is, just, just pick it. Don't be double-minded. Make a decision. There's no peace in between. In the ninth verse, he says, but let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner is the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. It, its flower falls and its beauty, a beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. James reminds us of what's really important in life. 
He reminds us about what is important in life. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. It, it's great to rejoice, to glory when the Lord lifts you up. But look what he says about the rich man in his humiliation. Why? Because as the flower of the field, he will pass away. Life is short. It is unpredictable. Riches don't change that fact. Trials, death, it doesn't care how much money you got in the bank. It doesn't care what you built up over your life. It means nothing. But what means more than everything is to know Him. He goes on in the 12th verse, he says, Blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he is approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. Now understand this. James, he starts the epistle out by talking about trials. And now here in verse 12, he's talking about temptations. These are different. They're not the same. Blessed is a man who endures temptation. He starts off by, by saying, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So why should we count it all joy when we fall into various trials? Because the testing of our faith will produce patience and endurance. Blessed is a man who endures temptation. See, the trials in our life, they make us stronger. That we're able to endure other trials. But temptations, they, they seek to get you to walk in rebellion to God that you would sin. And the Bible says, blessed is he who endures temptation. For when he is, uh, for when he is approved, when he is tested and he overcomes, he will receive a crown of life from the Lord. See, the testing of your faith, it produces the endurance. You come out of trials stronger. Your faith is stronger. Those who have strong faith, they ask and they receive wisdom from God. Now, when you're equipped with this endurance, this patience, that word uh, in the Greek is hypomone. And it's a noun. Understand this. It's a noun. So when, when you're equipped with endurance and patience and wisdom, when temptations come your way, you can endure. That word uh, is hypomino, which is the verb form of that same word. It is putting into action that endurance and patience that one has gained from the trials that they have gone through. The promise is that you will receive a crown of life for those who love Him. The word love there, again, is not the noun form of the word. It's not agape. It's the verb form of the word, which is agapal. Those who love God, those who love Him in their actions, not so much their feelings. Look what Jesus says here in Luke 6. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things in which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll show whom he is like. And he, he talks about, because ultimately hearers of the word only and not doers, they are building a house on sand. It is not a foundation that will stand in the end. So we count it all joy when we fall into these various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith will produce the patience, the endurance that we need to face the temptations in this life. Because the goal of Satan is to get you to sin, is to get you so loaded with sin. It's much like we were talking, I was talking to Tim yesterday about, uh, you know, people doing drugs. You know, and, 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 and here, Tim's like, these people, I, I would love to have the health that they have, but yet they are doing drugs, destroying their life. They're destroying their life. See, God has given us the patience and the endurance, the strength that we don't go down the path that will ultimately destroy us because that's what sin does. The wages of sin have always been 
and will always be death. It will work death in you. That's why Satan wants you to sin. That's why temptations come your way to get you off course. But when we go through trials and we become stronger, it's kind of like watching that, that movie. What was that movie's name again? Guardian. Guardian. Here you had the instructor who was hard on, on, on the people who he was instructing, on the students. He was hard on them, but there was a reason that he had to be hard on them. He had to toughen them up that they could stand when they actually got out into the field. And that's what God does for every one of us when we're going through life. We'll say, God, why did you let this trial come my way? God is making you stronger. It is the testing of your faith that produces endurance. It produces strength that you might stand in that day. Your trust for God will continue to grow. I fully trust the Lord. Whether I live today or I die today, my, my hope is in Him. My hope is in Him. I don't fear death. I don't fear anything because I know that I seek His will every day. And what will happen, what will happen. But my trust, no matter what happens, I'm not just trusting God for good times and wealth in the future. No matter what happens, my trust will, will stand strong because I, my faith had been tested many times over the years. And I stand here today because of that. And who knows the trials that come tomorrow. And had I not stood the trials of the past, maybe I wouldn't make it through the trials of tomorrow. Maybe you won't either. So when trials come, as James says, count it all joy. Count it all joy. It's hard to at the time. But I look back and I thank God for the, the difficulties in my life. I would not be the man I am today if it wasn't for those. Trust the Lord. Count it all joy. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. Father, I pray that you would help us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith will produce patience, will produce endurance that you will make us stronger. Help us to trust in you with everything, Father. Let us not be like a doubter who is, who is tossed to and fro by the wave. Father, let us trust you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.